afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone here. Before I start, I would like to thank MAP for giving me this opportunity to talk. Today we'll be exploring the East-West musical exchanges starting from the very early years to the contemporary times with special focus on Ravi Shankar, a revolutionary musician who performed around the world and collaborated with musicians across multiple genres of music, such as classical, pop, jazz, folk, you name it. Music does not exist in isolation. It's always shaped by the changing social, cultural, and political landscapes. For centuries, musical legacies have crossed geographical boundaries. And India has had its share of such musical interactions. Indian music uh, has mainly been influenced by Central and West Asians, and later by the European colonists. Of course, Indians also have taken their music to other parts of the world via migration. By the 12th and the 13th centuries, waves of invaders from West and Central Asia brought their musical cultures to North India. The present form of uh, Hindustani music that we see thus represents a confluence of Islamic and Indian practices. It also gave birth to subgenres of Hindustani music like khayal and uh, semi-classical forms like ghazal and tumri. Later, musical cross-cultural interactions happened during the colonial times. A good example would be uh, Muthuswami Dikshitar, one of the trinity of Carnatic music. He was inspired by the tunes played by the British Army marching bands, and he composed Notuswara. Conversely, Hindustani music also found its way into English drawing rooms in the form of compositions broadly categorized of Hindustani airs, which were essentially Hindustani ragas and compositions adopted to harpsichord. Now let's listen to a short clip of uh, Jane Chapman, a uh, harpsichordist, where she explores the Oriental miscellany. So as uh, colonizations moved people around the world, their musical instruments migrated with them. Instruments brought by the British, Dutch, and the French were adapted to Indian music, sometimes with a few modifications to the instrument to suit the Indian music and its ethos. Harmonium and violin, originally Western instruments, were um, it, it has become an indispensable part of Indian music, a proof that the boundaries of culture are indeed fluid. Now, uh, let's look at a short clip of a pedal harmonium. Notice that the harmonium was originally bulky and was operated by a pedal. It was later indigenized to facilitate playing while seated on the ground. Thank you. 
the pedal harmonium was extensively used in uh, Marathi Natya Sangeet, and that's the video you're uh, seeing. During the same time, Indian migration to other countries led to mixing of cultures, such as Asian underground music in UK and the Chetney and Soka music in Trinidad and Tobago. But in contemporary history, Indo-Western interaction really took its root in the 60s. In 1960s, uh, there was a wave of counterculture, an anti-establishment cultural phenomenon that opposed the war of Vietnam, commercialism, and uh, overall societal norms. People adopted new styles of dressing, experimented with psychedelic drugs, they lived communally, and developed a vibrant music scene. Psychedelic uh, rock music was one of the most popular music during those times. Um, and at the same time, post-independent India had started using cultural diplomacy to build uh, bridges with other countries through its cultural festivals, student exchange programs, film exchange, and various other initiatives. So really the timing of uh, timing was best for the for a east a west interaction and the central figure uh, for that was the sitar master uh, ravi shankar he established himself as a major representative of indian music in the west he recorded more than 60 albums collaborated widely with other legendary musicians and he won five grammy awards including a lifetime achievement award in fact, he is one of the only six musicians to be awarded the Bharat Ratna, India's highest civilian award. In uh, 2020, uh, his centennial year, we at IME put an exhibition up to celebrate his, his contribution to the world. Curating uh, this exhibition um, was like a Dive, was like diving deep into uh, the artist's life and understanding the work from their perspective. For a better understanding of his life, we can split um, it into three eras. The first mm, is the early era, early years, where we explore his childhood and the events that shaped the making of the master. The second era is the golden years, which outlines the contribution, outlines his contribution to the world of music. And the last one would be his legacy and how he paved the way for future musicians um, and artists. Let's take a look at uh, his early uh, years. Now, Although there was an explosion of interest in uh, Indian music in 1960s, there was a large interest even before that. In Europe of 1930s, Uday Shankar, Ravi Shankar's brother, was a noted dancer and also a choreographer. He was best known for creating a fusion style of uh, dance. Uh, adapting European theatrical techniques to Indian classical dance with a few elements of folk and tribal dance. He had a very inventive and a unique dance movement. His troupe traveled across Europe and USA in 1920s and the 30s. Ravi Shankar initially toured as a dancer with his brother's troupe uh, from the time he was 10 years old. During his travels, he met some awe-inspiring artists like Anna Pavlova, Clark Gable, jo Joanne Crawford, and listened to live musicians like Stravinsky, Louis Armstrong. It was as if the universe was conspiring to make him this huge global musician he later became. Let's see a rare clip of uh, Ravi Shankar cherishing those memories.
he created a whole new style, but it was never, never westernized. That's the beauty of it. His inspiration was, at that time, what he had seen in his childhood in Rajasthan. That was a video from the archives of uh, British Pate. The next momentous event in his life was finding his guru. Traveling with Uday Shankar's troupe was Baba Alauddin Khan, a musical genius. He was full of creativity and was a multi-instrumentalist. But after the tour, Baba returned to India. That was when Ravi Shankar felt a sense of loss and he decided to immerse himself in music under his tutelage. For seven years, Ravi Shankar lived in Baba's humble home in Maihar, Madhya Pradesh, and learned music in the Guru Shishya Parampara. Later, um, you know, uh, you know, other than the rigor uh, that he imbibed from Baba, he also learned composing of music for harmony. During the uh, uh, 1918 uh, Spanish uh, flu pandemic, which killed over 12 million people in India alone, many children were orphaned. Baba Alauddin Khan to provide solace uh, to these children had put a wonderful musical ensemble with multiple instruments, Indian and Western. This exposure to composing music for harmony was a stepping stone for Ravi Shankar's future endeavors like Vadya Vrinda. Vadya Vrinda was uh, India's first national orchestra. This was founded by Ravi Shankar during his stint in All India Radio in 1948. He composed music where he combined Western and Indian instrumentation. Along with Indian instruments, he used many Western instruments such as violin, uh, double bass, clarinet, and cello. With that, we come to the next part of his life, the golden years. Ravi Shankar's golden years started when he met Ehudi Menuhin, a very accomplished American violinist. He was deeply interested in other musical cultures and played a key role in um, introducing Indian music to the West. His partnership with Ravi Shankar reinforced that it was possible to bridge the musical cultures of the West and the East. Their meeting uh, sparked a lifelong friendship that resulted in many collaborations, including the West Meets East trilogy, in which Yehudi played Ravi Shankar's compositions based on Indian ragas and talas. For Ravi Shankar, it was a doorway to Western audience. Let's see a short clip of their collaboration. <laughs> happened suddenly. It took me a full 15 years or more before I had the courage to agree to play with Ravi. from the documentary, The Portrait of the Maestro of Sitar. And the concert you saw was part of East meets West at the UN. Meanwhile, George Harrison of the Beatles, one of the world's biggest pop bands at the time, was gravitating towards the spiritual aspect of Indian music. 
Fascinated by the sounds of sitar, George had already played sitar in the song Norwegian Wood. That was the first appearance of Indian instrument on a Western rock recording. In the mid 60s, George approached Ravi Shankar for lessons and later became a devout student and collaborator, despite their contrasting personalities. They were different in every way, age, culture, music, personalities, and yet Ravi Shankar and George Harrison shared a lifelong bond. George Harrison called him the godfather of world music. Through this association, Ravi Shankar's music reached new and young audience of the Western world. Let's see a short clip of Ravi Shankar teaching George Harrison. This clip was taken when uh, George visited India and the class was held near Dal Lake in Kashmir. The 60s witnessed the rise of counterculture movement in the West, characterized by hippie culture, anti-war protests, and rock and roll music. Music festivals embodied the youthful spirit of the time. In 67, playing at the Monterey Pop Festival in California, Ravi Shankar was unknown to most of the audience. But the emotional intensity of the four hour long set left many of them deeply moved. Two years later, Ravi Shankar played Raga's Puriya Dhanishri and uh, Manj Khamaj at the Woodstock. Nearly half a million people attended uh, the three-day festival. By this time, he was very well known, especially to the young music fans of America. Though drug use was prevalent at uh, the Woodstock, his music provided an alternative to the mind-expanding drugs that were rampant at that festival. Uh, we'll see another short clip of this concert at the Montreux Pop Festival. One of the other things Ravi Shankar did was to use music to bring people together for a cause. 
The roots of this can be traced way back when he started his career and was part of an organization he used, um, uh, which used music and theater for a social revolution called IPTA, Indian People's Theater Association. In fact, he uh, composed Sare Jahan Se Achha, the National Song of India during those days. In uh, 1971, Ravi Shankar was at the peak of his career when Bangladesh Liberation War uh, left the country in shambles. Ravi Shankar, deeply moved by their suffering, approached George Harrison with an idea of a rock concert to raise funds and raise awareness for this uh, international humanitarian crisis. They quickly put together the first ever benefit of such magnitude featuring a super group of performers raising $250,000 at the event. And of course, millions later, George Harrison, Ravi Shankar, Ali Akbar Khan, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Ringo Starr, many others performed at this concert. The concert resulted in a Grammy award winning triple album and a documentary film. This event also provided inspiration to many such live aid uh, concerts that followed. Then came Ravi Shankar's major leap into bridging Western music and Indian music. While Indian music concert focuses on creativity and normally accompanied by one or two instruments, classical Western music concerts have huge ensembles. Now, how did Ravi Shankar bridge the two? He started composing for orchestras, concertos, based on Indian ragas. Ravi Shankar composed three concertos, a symphony and an opera. One of the key compositions was uh, for the New York Philharmonic Orchestra conducted by Zubin Mehta in 1980. It was composed of 40 Indian ragas and unusual time signatures. Although he had uh, worked with many Western musicians, it's important to note that he did not, he was not making fusion music by mixing two different forms of music. He was essentially playing Indian music in different formats. He always said he had two sides to him. One was the traditional side loyal to his guru and the gharana, and the other side was uh, his urge to experiment with different formats, but still remained within the framework of traditional uh, music, traditional Hindustani music. Ravi Shankar's career is an example of how boundaries of traditional art form can be stretched. He introduced new unlikely audience to Indian music. He inspired his Western fans and musicians to explore music to a deeper level of level by training their ears for long and slow improvisations, uh, like we do in uh, Hindustani classical music. His legacy lives on through uh, hundreds of his students he left behind. Importantly, his daughter Anushka, who um, is an internationally acclaimed sitar player with six Grammy nominations to her credit. Ravi Shankar is also the father of a multi-Grammy uh, award-winning singer, songwriter, and pianist, Nora Jones. Other than his direct disciples, he has also influ influenced many musicians belonging to different mm -hmm. genres of music, from pop to rock to jazz. As an interesting aside, American jazz saxophonist John Coltrane named his son Ravi after the sitar maestro from whom he learned the fundamentals of Indian classical music and found inspiration of his, for his own music. 101 years after Ravi Shankar's birth, this story is still relevant. Why? A large part of music making in the contemporary times has become collaborative. And most of it is cross-cultural. Thanks to the technology and the internet, which has enabled the world to collaborate remotely. During the pandemic, 
we have seen an explosion of this. This has manifested in all genres of music, classical, folk, contemporary uh, musicians are, are all performing on global platforms and interacting around the world. Film songs, as well as background scores composed in the last 80 years span India have employed Western orchestrations of some kind of the other. They've used um, Western orchestrations as embellishment tool or for harmony. Artists like Adi Burman, Ilay Raja, and Yair Rahman have gained mastery over Western orchestration. Indian percussion has become a global phenomenon with stalwarts like Vikku Vinayak Ram, Zakir Hussain, and many others who collaborated and interacted with peers around the world. And the roots uh, for uh, this collaboration, next slide please. And the roots for this cross cultural collaboration in contemporary times, as we saw, largely began with Pandit Ravi Shankar, who helped connect the world through his music. Having said that, is there scope for a lot more? While Indian music has taken huge strides, why don't we see more international concerts from India? Why don't we see uh, more uh, Grammy winners from India? We may have a few lessons to learn from Ravi Shankar's life. The way I see it, it's hold on to your roots. Be uniquely Indian and yet be open to the rest of the world. Communicate, make presentations relevant to your audience. Talk about them before the concert. Think beyond oneself and for the greater good, for music, and learn to live life to the fullest with humility and humor. I would like to leave you with a video made by his students recently on his 100th birthday during the pandemic. It's yet another example of remote collaboration. There's a famous saying by Rudyard Kipling, East is East, West is West, and never the twain shall meet. Ravi Shankar, on the other hand, proved that music know, knows no boundaries and is able to transcend all barriers. Mm -hmm.
Uh, with that, uh, we come to the end of this talk. And I hope you found this talk interesting. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Thank you.